If you're looking to save money, reduce food waste, and make some delicious food, then making your own chicken stock at home is a fantastic thing to do. It's rich and delicious, full of valuable nutrients, and the main ingredients are things that you'd probably normally throw in the bin. And it's also really easy. Trust me, you won't regret it. Let's get adventurous. You can make chicken stock in a saucepan, a crock pot or Dutch oven, a slow cooker or a pressure cooker. The same ingredients apply, the only difference is the cooking technique and time. And in this video I'll explain each of these methods. The main ingredient in chicken stock, not surprisingly, is chicken. And every single part of the chicken is valuable, nothing should be wasted. Meat, bones, skin, cartilage, everything is full of nutrients and flavour. The skin and bits of cartilage like this one will break down into collagen and then into gelatin. The bones will leach out calcium. Any remaining meat will release proteins and everything will release color and flavor. So whenever I buy a rotisserie chicken or we have a roast chicken at home, I always make sure that I keep all of the leftover scraps to make sure that nothing goes to waste. Chicken meat will add good flavor to the stock, but if it's still good and you've got a use for it, it seems wasteful not to eat it. So I like to remove all the meat from the bones and then put all of the scraps into a container which I keep in the freezer. I like to break the carcass up as much as I can. This just helps to fit as much as possible into each container. And remember, we don't want to waste anything at all. Even the scraps and little bits of jelly and goo the bottom of the bag are going to be great additions. The quantities required for this recipe are super flexible. You can make a really big batch or a really small batch. I like to keep saving up my chicken bones until I've got two or three carcasses worth. I like to make a really big batch, that way I can stock my freezer full and have a steady supply of chicken stock for months ahead. And it doesn't matter where your chicken scraps come from, it doesn't have to be the carcass of a rotisserie chicken. Here I've got some KFC chicken wing bones and they'll do just fine too. The little bit of spicy breading that's still attached will be fine. If anything, it's just going to add more flavor. And really, any meal where you've got some leftover chicken meat, bones, skin, cartilage, or anything else that's going to go to waste, chuck it in the container and pop it in the freezer. Here I've got a zinger that I couldn't quite finish, so I'm not going to let that chicken go to waste. We don't want the bun or the lettuce, but that little bit of chicken breast and the breading around it is far too good to throw away and will make a great addition to this stock. I'll be making my chicken stock in a pressure cooker, but you could easily make this in a saucepan, a Dutch oven, or a slow cooker. So I'll talk you through the technique for each of these options. I'm going to start by getting my stockpile of chicken bones out of the freezer and then put them into whatever cooking vessel you're planning to use. This is about three chickens worth of bones plus a few other bits and bobs and I know from experience that this is about the most that I can safely fit in my pressure cooker. Once our chicken's organized we're going to need some aromatic vegetables. If you're feeling really frugal you can keep vegetable scraps and offcuts in a container in the freezer too but I think you get a cleaner flavor with fresh vegetables. If you are going to use frozen scraps I suggest throwing them in in the last 10 minutes of cooking otherwise they overcook, turn to mush and can release some off flavors. So for my stock today, I'm using fresh vegetables. What vegetables you use and how much is fairly flexible, but today I'm going with an onion, two carrots, three sticks of celery, and a head of garlic. Obviously, you don't need to be too fussy about how neatly your vegetables are chopped, but chopping them into reasonably small pieces will help to extract more flavor. And don't bother about peeling anything. The skin's perfectly fine to go in. It'll add even more color and flavor. Do be a bit cautious if you're chopping an onion with the skin on. The skin can be quite tough to cut through, so make sure you You've got a really sharp knife. This Japanese knife is nice and sharp so it shouldn't have too much trouble. If you're interested in any of the equipment that I use I'll put some links in the description so you can check them out. The head of garlic I'm just going to chop in half and then I'm going to give it a bit of a smash but I'm not going to do that with my Japanese knife. The Japanese steel is extremely hard which means it maintains a really sharp edge for a long time. The downside to that is that they're quite brittle and the last thing I want to do is break the blade. Next up we need to think about some aromatics. A combination of fresh or dry herbs and spices to complement the flavors of the stock. My garden's full of fresh herbs but if you don't have fresh dried is absolutely fine. I'm picking a good handful of bay leaves, four or five should do a really big handful of thyme, and a few sprigs of sage. Again, quantities aren't super important here. Just throw in a handful of everything that you think is going to be nice. Parsley would be a great addition too, but I don't have any of that growing at the moment. I like to bruise my bay leaves a bit before I put them in the pot. I find this helps them to release their flavor a bit quicker. And then the rest of the herbs I'm just nestling in the top. 
And then I'm adding in a good handful of black peppercorns. Again, these flavorings are completely optional. You can leave these out or mix and match them with other things that you think would work. I like to add a small amount of vinegar, not very much. I'm not looking to add any flavor from this, but adding a little bit of acidity helps to leach out some of the calcium and other nutrients from the bones. So in a pot this size, I'm adding about a tablespoon, maybe a bit less. Then we're going to fill the pot with water. Now, obviously, the more water you add, the more stock you're going to get, but the more diluted the stock's going to be. I find the best balance is to fill the pot with enough water to cover everything, but not too much more. I also like to use filtered water for this. I think the better the quality of the water going in, the better quality the stock coming out will be. And I'm just poking some of these herbs down into the other ingredients, just to make sure they don't end up all floating on top. Now, if you're making this in a saucepan on the stove, put it over the heat, bring it up to a boil, then reduce the heat as low as you can so it's barely simmering and allow it to simmer for about three to four hours. If you want your stock to be nice and clear, you can skim some of the scum off the top, but that's optional. This scum is just proteins. It looks kind of gross when it's cooking, but it's not going to do any harm, but it might make the end result a little bit cloudy. If you'd like to make this in the oven, in a Dutch oven or casserole dish, I put it into a cold oven, set it to 110 degrees Celsius, and let it go for four to six hours. For a slow cooker, I set it on low temperature for eight hours. And my preferred method in the pressure cooker, I'm bringing this up to high pressure and then letting it go for 45 minutes or an hour at the most, and then turning off the heat and letting the pressure drop naturally. Straining this volume of stock can be a bit awkward. If you've got a really fine mesh strainer, that might be good enough, but I don't. So I improvise using a large bowl, a couple of wooden spoons, a colander, and a clean cloth. Using the two spoons as a base to balance the colander over the bowl, then dampening a thin cleaning cloth and using that to line the colander. This will strain out any fine sediment and leave us with a nice clear broth. Now let's have a first look at our stock. That looks really nice. It's developed a really nice deep brown color. Smells intensely chickeny, and I'm sure it's gonna taste great. Because this is such a large volume of hot liquid, I find it easier to not pick up the saucepan and try and pour it in. I find it much easier to use a ladle. So I'll just spoon in a little bit at a time and let it trickle through the filter into the bowl. After a while, if the cloth gets a bit too gunked up with sediment, like mine is here, you can take it out and give it a wash. Eventually, if it gets to a point where I feel like the pot is safe enough to lift, I'll pick it up and pour in the remaining liquid. One of the reasons I like doing this in the pressure cooker is because it's so quick. The other is because of how well it extracts goodness from the bones. These are the bones that have come out of the pressure cooker, and as you can see, they're basically falling apart. They are as soft as butter, because all of the goodness has been cooked out into the stock. As it starts to cool, you might find a slightly unpleasant looking layer forming on the top, but that's fine. That's actually really good. That's just gelatin. That means we've done a really good job of breaking down all the bits of cartilage and skin into collagen and then into gelatin. That's going to make sure this stock has a really nice body and mouthfeel. Now if you taste this chicken stock right now, you might think, mm, it's a little bit bland. And that's because at this point we haven't added any salt. And that's intentional to keep this stock as flexible as possible. I want to be able to use this stock in a wide range of different dishes, and I might not be able to do that if I've already seasoned it with salt. If I'm going to use it in something that's going to cook for a long time, it's going to concentrate more and might end up too salty. If I'm going to use it in an Asian dish, I'm probably not going to add salt. I'm going to add soy sauce instead. So by keeping it salt free, it means I can use this for the broadest possible range of applications. I like to package this up in different sized containers, large containers for soups, stews and risottos, smaller containers for single servings, stir fries and sauces. I'm going to put one of these small containers in the fridge to use later on and the rest can go into the freezer where it will keep for at least six months, giving me a continuous supply of delicious homemade stock. And once it's had a chance to cool down, you can see just how gelatinous it is. That's the sign of a good stock. It means we've done a really good job of extracting all the goodness out of the bones and cartilage and it's going to have a really nice body and flavor. Soon I'll be posting some delicious recipes that use this chicken stock, so hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on those. In the meantime, here's another recipe you might like, and until next time, happy snacking. <laughs>